Hi, it's Dwyer, GamblersAdvisory.com, DwyerVIP.com. Look us up on the sports section on Roku. We're there, Dwyer Boxing and Sports News. As an aside, I have more subscribers there than the 6,000 plus I have here on YouTube. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Let's talk about last night's Danny Garcia Rod Salka fight, right? To the gamblers, you were taken care of. The hedge, Danny Garcia by KO, held. You should have gotten that hedge at a minus 200. Given the fact that you were getting better than 10 to 1 odds on the other side of the play, Rod Salka to win the fight, right? Understand. This was that rare opportunity where you had a chance to swing for the fences, to go for big profits. And if the roof caved in, as it did last night, right, as it did last night, you still were able to live for another day. Leave without losses. If you structured the bet correctly, given the odds, a minus 200 versus, let's say, a plus 1100, you even left the casino with money. But, understand, this morning, I'm a little chagrined, right? Because I feel Rod Salka should have done a lot better. Quite frankly, I thought Rod Salka could have won this fight, right? I know that's not the way the public sees it. Right, I couldn't care less because understand, I believe profits are the gap between what the people around you think and what reality is. The reality is that Danny Garcia, right, like most of us, really like all of us, has strengths and weaknesses. He's not a perfect fighter. Who is? right but in his case a mobile opponent who can capitalize on the fact that Danny Garcia is a mid-range hooker who does not move that well could bust him up right could win on the scorecards so let's talk about styles here and let's talk about what I believe Rod Salka did wrong. Right now, let me say, and it's relevant, if you watch the entire card yesterday, the fight before this fight was a masterpiece by Lamont Peterson. A masterpiece. Right? You know I rarely call fights masterpieces. But Lamont Peterson against Santana, right, opens that fight, literally gives you a blueprint on how to beat a mid-range hooker. He's moving around from the outside early. Like Rod Salka versus Danny Garcia, he has a foot speed advantage. So you actually see him moving around the ring early. He has Santana trying to catch up with him. The angles change. He's not just standing in front of Santana. He's moving. So Santana has to turn. Right? And as he turns, Lamont Peterson is coming in with great punches. In other words, as he's moving, he's winning the rounds. But then the fight becomes breathtaking. Now keep in mind, I didn't have a dog in that fight. I'm talking about a fight that I did not have a bet on. Right? But then Lamont Peterson, as the fight progresses, decides he's going to come inside where he has few peers, right, as fans of Amir Khan know. So Peterson comes inside, puts a shoulder 
Aunt Santana starts going to work and is such a technician inside that he's able to throw punches with both hands without getting hit and he's able to take out Santana's body inside and while he does this and while he's leaning on Santana he's able to move that shoulder away and land uppercuts right the point is this you have to pick what you're doing against a mid-range hooker you have to be outside or inside you can't be mid-range you also have to hide your body you can't stand there upright in front of a mid-range hooker you need angles so look at Peterson right when he comes inside he's leaning he knows where Santana's hands are. He knows when Santana can hit him. He knows when Santana can't hit him. Right? There's a certain pace to the fight. There's a certain rhythm. Right? Where he can tell if Santana hits him, there's going to be a gap period where Santana can't hit him. Let me say, too, if you're a mid-range hooker depending on balance right mid-range hookers seem to be one hand then the other hand right one hand then the other hand this is different than someone who can come in and throw three or four of the same hand right who keep you guessing on the hand they're gonna throw now let's talk about Danny Garcia and Rod Salka. Right? And let me say, the Garcia people who believed that Garcia would win by a blowout were correct. Let me just state my part of the argument, keeping in mind that part of my hedge was Garcia by KO. So I'm living for another day. But first, let's talk about the height gap and the weight gap. You know, there seemed to be a size difference between Salka and Danny Garcia. That's great. As someone who hoped Salka would win the fight so I could collect the greater than 10 to 1 odds, I had no problem whatsoever with the height gap. Understand, being a bigger man in the ring, especially when you have slower foot speed and you're supposed to be the slugger, right you're not the stylist but you're the slugger that could actually be a curse right because if Rod Salka the guy with the superior legs had moved around the ring a little bit better as it was he was out maneuvering Danny Garcia but if he moved around the ring a little bit better the bigger man Garcia would have been forced to actually move that extra weight all around the ring. Right? Understand, history is replete with guys like Jimmy Young beating Big George Foreman. Right? Mike Tyson often was the smaller man in the ring against bigger opponents. Right, force the big man to have to move his weight. Right, force the big man to have to actually try to find you in the ring. So Danny Garcia's size didn't bother me at all. Rod Salka, who only had three KOs going in the fight, if you were a Salka person, you weren't expecting Rod Salka to come in and knock him out early. Rather, you were expecting Rod Salka to come in and make him move early. Right? That's what you wanted him to do. Have him move. Let me also point out, too, that, you know, in basketball, we're seeing LeBron James lose a lot of weight before this season. Right? He wants to lose weight to be more limber, more athletic. Right? Understand in boxing, when guys have extra weight on the night of a fight, weight they gained after the weigh-in, right? That could slow them down. There's a reason why fighters like to 
stay in shape and come in in great shape. There's a reason why LeBron James is trying to lose weight before the next basketball season. Consider yourself lucky if slow-moving Danny Garcia has extra weight on fight night. Right? If you're an opponent who plans to win on mobility, forcing him to move around the ring. The extra weight should have benefited Rod Salka, not Danny Garcia. If you were a Salka supporter, you knew Salka was going to be in trouble if he tried to stand and trade with Danny. You knew that whatever the weight. So the fact that Danny is bigger on fight night, I had no problems with that. That actually excited me. That actually made the greater than 10 to 1 odds more possible in my book. Let's talk about the height gap. I like that too. Right? Understand, I wanted Danny Garcia to have to reach for Rod Salka. I thought Rod Salka would have an opportunity to actually bend and fight small. Right? Force Danny Garcia to actually have to reach for him. Understand, if I'm a mid-range hooker and I'm throwing power on hooks, let's say headshots and body shots, that's where my power is. My power might not translate if I have to change the angles and when I'm throwing the same punches from the same stance, if I have to throw them wider, my power is going to dissipate. I'm not going to be comfortable. The angles of my construct change. So I thought, you know what, Rod Salk is a little bit shorter. He should fight this fight bending while moving. Take a look at a Sean Porter fight. In fact, take a look at Sean Porter against Devin Alexander. You're going to see Sean Porter's always bending. Right? He comes in. When he comes in low, he comes in and he's bent. Right? Sean Porter understands that sometimes a lack of height's a blessing. It allows you to do other things. Right? Big clunky guys like Vladimir Klitschko, he can't bend low and be too far away for you to hit him. Right? Because there's too much of him. But a shorter fighter, a Joe Fraser, right? And Fraser's left hook was a game-changing punch. Right? You can have knockout power, but a Joe Fraser would come in and watch him. While he's bobbing and weaving, he's low. So I was expecting Rod Salka to fight more like Sean Porter. Bend. Move. Let me say, too, if you watch the telecast, right, there's a moment, and I was watching the uh, Box Nation telecast. There's a moment where they show you Salka's dressing room before the fight. And his trainer, Paul Spatafora, is sparring with him. They're just, you know, getting ready, going over the nuts and bolts. And in that moment, Spatafora actually shows you the fight Salka should have fought. They're sparring, and then Spatafora dips a shoulder and moves around. Right? The point is... The sparring had to be coupled with movement. Now the crowd at Barclays was into it, right? They had just seen Danny Jacobs win the middleweight title. Then they watched a Lamont Peterson masterpiece. Really, what Peterson did in his fight, that's the best performance I've seen this year. And this is a year where we've had Janady Golovkin throw down explosive performances and stuff like that. Just from a technical standpoint, right, I thought Peterson was top shelf. Then we get to this fight. Something happened to Rod Salka. He gets in the ring. He has the foot speed on Danny Garcia. That's obvious 20 seconds into the fight. Right? Rod, you had 12 rounds. 12 rounds to beat the champ. Not three, not four, but 12 rounds to beat the champ. 
right? Why not figure out the angles early? Why trade at all with Danny Garcia early? Why not just showcase the foot speed, walk around? Let me even go further. While you figure out the angles, why ever throw your right hand? Why not pump a jab? You can hint like you're throwing your right hand. Why not just pump a jab? Keep your defense intact while you're figuring out the angles. Something happened. Maybe the stage got to Rod Salka. I really don't know. Maybe Rod got a little bit too excited. But somehow, against a fighter who was obvious, right? You knew Danny Garcia was going to stand about mid-range. You, you knew Danny was going to plant a leg, right? That front foot, flat-footed. You know he was going to plant a leg. Then you knew he was going to duck his head. And you knew he was just going to throw a punch like that, right? You knew that after throwing a punch like that, his next punch was going to be he was going to duck his head, he was going to throw a punch like that. The only, um, the only, you know, intrigue was whether he was throwing a punch to the body or to the head, right? The idea for mid-range hookers is they're throwing punches, they're coming from outside, right? But you don't know if it's a head shot or if it's a body shot. It's hard to tell on the way in, right? Because the punch is coming from an outside angle, right? My point to you is Rod Salka shouldn't have been in the pocket. He shouldn't have been mid-range. If you have the foot speed advantage, just keep the guy turning for the first round. You want to land some punches, pump a jab. Keep your defensive construct. Right? If you want to limit what the other guy's doing, if you don't want to spend your time guessing if it's a headshot or a body shot, take away the angle. Right? Bend at the waist. Make the head and body the same plane. In other words, if I'm upright, yeah, you can hit me in the head, you can hit me in the body. Right? For purposes of this video, the way it's framed, let's say my body's right here. Let's say my head is right here. Right? Smart fighters working angles would bend, would make the head and the body the same angle as they move. Look at Sean Porter. Right? If I do that, then you don't have the strategy option of throwing a head or body shot on this side. Right? On this side, it's all one shot. If my head and body are lined up, if I'm leaning, this is why guys lean at the waist, if I'm leaning as I'm moving, the great movers are able to lean either back or forward. Right? Back Ali, forward, Sean Porter. I'm just naming two examples. Right? They're able to lean. They're able to take away an angle. That's what Rod Salka should have done. I thought Salka got too caught up in the fight. I thought he was too upright. Right? He couldn't guess whether it was a head or body shot, and he got hit with some bombs. Right? In the second round, Salka goes down. I believe it's a couple of times. Then he gets back up. The fight's still a winnable fight. Salka knows that. Because I'm sure Salka, even then, while getting dropped in the second round, even then, he knows that Danny Garcia is playing three notes. Right? Garcia is not a jazz musician. He's not the Gale. He's not Calzaghe. He's playing three notes. So when Rod Salka gets up off the canvas before the fatal knockdown, right? It's baffling to me, and I understand boxing has egos, but it's baffling to me why Salka, in front of Danny Garcia, 
a guy who's throwing bombs at mid-range, would stay at mid-range. Maybe he was too dazed and confused, right? He looked puzzled on the first knockdown. Maybe he was too disoriented. But Salka, at that moment, shows bravado and starts pounding his chest, as if to say, hey, I'm still in this fight. Rather than pound his chest, I would have preferred for him to pump a jab. I would have preferred for him to turn a shoulder, move away. I would have preferred for him to bend at the waist as he turns a shoulder and moves away. Duck out of there. Get out of there. Pump a jab. Force the big man to come find you. Right? You don't have to go for a knockout early. You don't have to prove to the other guy that you're here for the fight. Right? Since you were knocked down two times in the round already, you're not going to win the round. You're not going to prove to the judges that you're going to win that round. So at that point, Salka should have been moving and he should have been low. He should have been leveraging his height and his mobility. Instead, he gets lured into the same kind of fight Amir Khan got lured into against Danny Garcia. I actually believe that Danny Garcia's shortcomings help his game because guys with skills and talent with legs right, who should be moving around, who should be out of the pocket, think Amir Khan, curiously stay in the pocket because they see the holes in Danny Garcia's game and they think they can just exploit them up close, right? So, yeah, today I'm not happy. Right? I thought Danny Garcia did exactly what we thought he was going to do style-wise. He came in, right? He's just throwing mid-range hooks. Right? Rod Salk is too close to him. You want him to follow you around the ring like a puppy. Right? Salka comes in. He's working angles. Then he stops. Then he's too close to him. Then he's up right, giving Danny a choice of headshots or body shots. Let me also say too, if you look at Danny's front foot, you know when he's going to throw punches, right? He plants the front foot and then he's throwing punches like this. Now let me just say this, right? A Lamont Peterson, a guy with a great inside game, and a great sense of timing. When a Danny Garcia has his head down and he's throwing a wide shot, doesn't that create an opportunity right here for an opponent? Right? Danny's shots are hooks. They're wide. Danny does have, you know, a straight right hand he throws on occasion. But most of his stuff's wide. A guy who times it right would find Danny naked. Let me say this too. When a guy's head's down and he's throwing mid-range hooks like this, a guy who times it right from the outside could be outside of the hook. Right? And then can move toward the hook. So, because you know Danny's not doubling up on much. Right? It's left right. That's how he keeps balance. That's how he's able to throw these home run balls, right? It's left, right. He puts too much into the punch to go left, left. And so my point is, Watsalka should have figured that out. He should have been looking at Danny's front foot, because Danny has to plan it to throw it. And he should have been moving around the ring a little bit more. I think the real burden, and I know I'm a voice crying in the graveyard who hoped that Salka would win so I'd collect <laughs> a lot of money. Okay, great, right? 
But the real tragedy for the Rod Salka crowd, the real burden they have, is in knowing that this was a winnable fight. I know the boxing public doesn't think so. I understand that. I know it's a second round KO. I know the crowd was jeering Danny. I know the outcry today is that this fight was a mismatch. It shouldn't have happened. I know the sanctioning body refused to sanction the fight as a title shot. I know people I respect greatly, uh, Teddy Atlas, criticized this fight when it was made. Right? Consider this video the other side of the world of opinion. Even as I watched the fight, I thought this was a winnable fight. As I watched the first half of the first round, I thought it was a winnable fight. I saw Danny Garcia. He looked stiff. He didn't move around the ring that much. Right? He's not tracking Salka over to the ropes. Far from it. Right? He's not moving around, you know, that much. He's throwing right, left, right, left, or left, right, left, right. Right? He's playing three notes. Right? Salka looks like he's the better athlete. Would have been great to see Salka bend at the knees. Would have been great to see Salka bend at the waist. Would have been great to see Salka tripling and quadrupling up on the jab. Folks, it's early in the fight. Rod, figure out the angles. Right? Don't get lured into a mid-range slugfest with a mid-range hooker. You've had better ideas. Right? I think Danny Garcia is going to be overrated in his next fight. Count me among those who, you know, the minute, if it's announced he's fighting Lamont Peterson, I'll be running to place a bet on Peterson with a hedge of Garcia by KO. Right? Sometimes the guys with belts do three things very well, but aren't total technicians. That's my take right now on Danny Garcia, right? He beat Rod Salka. He certainly landed the big punches. Salka's corner threw in the towel. I was grateful when the ref waved off the fight. I'm not even sure if the ref saw the towel, right? Great stoppage yesterday. Don't let knockouts cause amnesia, right? As you look at the fight, I'm not saying Salka won either round, but as you look at the fight, notice the gap in foot speed. Notice the left, right, left, right. Ask yourself if Danny Garcia is cutting off the ring. Right? Those are the questions today. Let me hear from you. Let me hear your questions. Leave your comments for me here online. Visit us at gamblersadvisory.com. Thanks for stopping by.